On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have a fantastic panel. Mr. Curtis Franklin, Mr. Brian Chi here today. And we talk just how IT pros are conflicted with trust in the cloud and just what could be forcing their hands to move there. Plus, we talk Wi-Fi 7 and if your organization should wait for it. And we have an amazing guest, Peter Wayne, co-founder and CEO of Anaconda. We talk about data models, ML, AI, and just how you can become a citizen data scientist with Python. Lots to talk about. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Twiat on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 478, recorded January 28th, 2022. I excel at Python. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Thinks Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the Hattie Hear About Us box. And by Linode. Get the cloud support experience you deserve with Linode. No tiers and no handoffs. Get $100 in credit. Visit linode.com slash twiat. And by CDW. From cybersecurity to multi-cloud strategy, CDW gets you need a trusted partner to help drive success. Learn more at cdw.com slash services. Welcome to Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I am your host, Louis Maresca, and it's great to be back. I've been on hiatus a little bit being with family, but it's great to be back. And I'm joined with an all-star cast, starting with their very own Mr. Brian Cheese, net architect at Sky Fiber, and all-around tech geek, Chebert. It's great to see you. What's uh, What's been keeping you busy? Uh, I'm cold. <laughs> We've got a freeze alert. And I know I sound like I'm whining, but you know, I moved to Florida because I wanted weather that was similar to Hawaii and we get a freeze alert. Oh, well. So I'm all bundled up trying to stay warm. And I actually turned the heat on the other day oh, for man. the first time. What is that? <laughs> yeah. Heat in Florida. That's, that's unheard of. Yeah. Well, keep warm. Hopefully, you're keeping warm. Well, uh, we're definitely we're, we're going to be turning on the heat ourselves. It's going to be snow apocalypse up here. But but my guess is uh, the the cold front won't last too long down there in Florida. But I do want to bring in another Floridian, our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's senior analyst at Amdia. Curtis, uh, are you uh, are you also as cold as Chebert? Are you, are you putting the heat on as well? We do have the heat on, and I would remind Brian that this is like Hawaii. It's just closer to Mauna Kea than Honolulu. You know, you got to have to have to set your expectations. Yeah, we are going to have polar bears wandering through over the weekend, but uh, you know, it will be uh, a day or two of cold, and that should put winter behind us, and then we can get on with being our regular Floridian selves. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, uh, you've you've been to a couple trade shows recently. Are you? Uh, what's what's coming up for you? Well, unfortunately, one of the big ones that was supposed to be happening uh, in just a, a handful of weeks has been postponed. Thank you, Omicron. Uh, so RSA is going to be in June this year. Um, you know, I'm I'm doing some. Um, some webinars have some big research projects going on involving uh, some of the human side of enterprise security management, things like uh, cybersecurity awareness training, uh, doing some risk management. So enjoying that, learning a lot uh, and getting ready to to write some things that uh, hopefully will appeal to a lot of folks. Fantastic. Great to have you guys on the show. Well, speaking of learning a lot and appealing to a lot of individuals, we have lots to talk about the enterprise uh, news area. Now, we talk a lot about digital transformations and moving to the cloud, but the truth is a lot of IT people just don't trust the cloud yet. That's right. They'd rather 
on premise. We'll talk about it. Plus, we really have a great guest today. We're going to talk about deep data and dive deep into data analytics and the ability to actually produce insights from your data, even if you're not a data scientist. We have the co-founder and CEO of Anaconda, Peter Wang, on the show, and he's going to take us through just how your organization can take advantage of AI for your data. So stick around. Lots to talk about here on Twiat. But before we do, we do have to thank, we have to, before we do, we do have to jump into this week's blips. Striving for a passwordless world is the ideal. That's because we know it's often a weak or lost password that's the vulnerability being exploited by the opportunistic hacker. Now, the statistics show that four in five breaches classified as a hack were partly caused by a weak or lost stolen password. That's where most cybersecurity reports or guides are telling the organizations to use more multi-factor authentications some using authenticators. Now, I bet you already have an authenticator on your phone right now. The question is, is it a safe authenticator? That's right. Cyber criminals go with the trends. We all know that. And if you're told to install an authenticator, you better bet they have their own version of an authenticator out there for the picking. Now, winner, winner, chicken dinner, The those who are betting people out there, according to the security report and firm, Pradio, a fake two-factor authentication app or 2FA app has been downloaded some 10,000 times from Google Play. Plus, it's stealthy install a known banking fraud trojan that scoured infected phones for financial data and other personal information. If people weren't paranoid already, this is an excellent way to ensure that they will be. Now, 2FA Authenticator went live on Google Play two weeks ago, posing as an alternative to the legitimate 2FA apps from Google, Twilio, and other trusted companies. Now, to make 2FA Authenticator look real, its developers started with this legitimate sample of the open source Aegis authentication application. An analysis of the malware shows that it really was programmed to provide its advertised authentication service. Now, behind the scenes, however, the stage one of the 2FA authenticator collected a list of apps installed on the device, along with the device's geographic location. The app would also disable Android lock screen, download third-party apps with the pretense updates, and overlay other mobile app interfaces to confuse users. Now, in retrospect, There were a lot of red flags here that experienced Android users could have spotted around that 2FA authenticator. Now, chief among them were the extraordinary number of breadth of system permissions required. A lot of, they asked a lot of permissions once you install it. Now that goes to show you that if your authenticator is asking to disable your lock screen, chances are malicious things are about to happen. Now, if this is good for your organization or not, but just make sure your organization is testing apps before they deploy them to make sure they're not only safe, but secure. Well, don't you just love it when people share? Threat actors certainly do, and they seem delighted that the authors of a dangerous malware sample targeting millions of routers and Internet of Things devices has uploaded its source code to GitHub, meaning other criminals can now quickly spin up new variants of the tool or use it as is in their own attack campaigns. Researchers at AT AT&T Alien Labs first spotted the malware last November and named it Botan-Go. The malware is written in Go, a programming language that's become quite popular among malware authors. It comes packed with exploits for more than 30 different vulnerabilities in products from multiple vendors, including Linksys, D-Link, Netgear, and ZTE. Botan-Go is designed to execute remote shell commands on systems where it has successfully exploited a vulnerability. Now, for reasons that are entirely unclear, the unknown author of the malware recently made Botanigo's source code publicly available through GitHub. The move could potentially result in a significant increase in Botanigo variants as other malware authors use and adapt the source code for their specific purposes in attack campaigns, Alien Alien Labs said in a blog this week. The company said it has observed new samples of Botanigo surface and in use to spread Mirai botnet malware on IoT devices and routers. One of Botanigo's payload servers is also in the list of indicators of compromise for the recently discovered Log4j vulnerabilities. According to Alien Labs, just three out of 60 antivirus programs on VirusTotal are currently capable of detecting the malware. The company compared the move to the one Mirai's authors made back in 2016 when they uploaded the source code for the malware to a hacking community forum. The code release resulted in the development of numerous Mirai variants such as Satori, Mubot, and Masuda, 
all of which have accounted for millions of IoT device infections. The FBI recently warned of an advanced USB-based attacks by a group called Fin7. The campaign, believed to have started last August, targets American companies, including those in key critical infrastructure industries such as transportation, insurance, and defense. The attackers targeted victims by sending them packages that contained advanced attack tools on USB devices. These bad USBs pose a significant threat. Here's what you need to know and do about that. Well, the attack technique and tools, well, it's believed that there are two variations of the packages, each of which is designed to trick users into using the USB devices. The first references COVID-19 guidelines, while the second claims to be a gift in decorative packaging with a fake gift card and thank you letter. These bad USBs are actually pen testing tools. A bad USB looks like a normal USB, but it presents itself to the operating system of the computer as another device, one that is more naturally trusted by a computer, such as a keyboard. Once inserted into the computer, the device invokes the Windows command line and executes a script that downloads an exploit. This causes an infection on the endpoint that enables attackers to initiate an attack sequence on the organization. And in the case of FIN7 attacks, ransomware. Well, okay, I need to defend these devices just a little bit and follow this up with the fact that these types of tools have been around for quite a while. So there's another URL that I'd like to bring up, and it's from Hack5 Corporation, and it's used for white hat penetration testing and is a follow-up of their original rubber ducky, which pretended it was a keyboard and would type in commands, uh, command line scripts. It could be Bass, she- Seashell, PowerScript, or many others. Since it pretends it's on a keyboard, the standby of turning off USB storage just doesn't work this time. I should also point out that this is yet another tool that is both white and black uses. Um, I like to run PowerShell scripts automatically to do setups for research workstations. Um, I'd also like to highlight that during DEF CON several years ago, white hat hackers purposely scattered random USBs around the venue, which would then do a harmless pop-up on your machine saying that you could have been owned. Well, it's pretty much gotten to the point where I carry around a USB condom. It's actually what you look for on Amazon. And it blocks the data lines so that I, when I charge my USB devices, it can't go and do anything worse. So maybe you might want to get a few of those. They're not expensive. Now, large organizations, especially public ones, tend to target to be targets of all types of constant attacks. So sometimes they're trying out, you know, hacking techniques against them. Sometimes it's espionage, but most of the time it's to try to take something that's worth something. Now, Microsoft is no stranger to getting hit from all sides when it comes to cyber attacks. According to Microsoft, back in November, they were hit with one of the biggest attacks the company had faced to date. It might have also been the largest attack in history. That's right. Microsoft says its Azure DDoS protection platform mitigated a massive 3.47 terabits per second distributed denial of service attack targeting an Azure customer from Asia in November. Two more large size attacks followed this December, also targeting Asian Azure customers, a 3.25 terabits per per second UDP attack on ports 80 and 443 and a 2.55 UDP flood on port 4 Four, three. Now, this is was a distributed attack originating from approximately 10,000 sources and from multiple crunch countries across the globe, including United States, China, South Korea, Russia, Thailand, India, Vietnam, Iran, Indonesia, and Taiwan. Now, the 15 minutes attack used multiple attack vectors for UDP reflection on port 80, including uh, SSDP, CLDAP, DNS, and NTP all at once. Now, previous record-breaking publicly reported DDoS attacks were around 28.1.8 million requests per second. It was an additional application layer assault that hit the Russian internet giant Yandex in August and a 2.3 terabits per second uh, volumetric strike detected by Amazon Web Services Shield during Q1 2020. Now, one theory is that this could have been game related. That's right. Gaming continues to be the hardest hit industry here. The gaming industry has always been rife with DDoS attacks because players often go to great lengths to win. The concentration of attacks in Asia can be explained mainly by the vast gaming footprint there, especially in China 
China, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and India. Now, we'll continue to grow as the increasing smartphone penetration drives the popularity of mobile gaming in Asia. That goes to show you, if you're playing Fortnite at work, you just might want to think twice about taking out one of those sore losers. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the news bites. But before we get to the news bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Things Canary. Now, if there's anything we've learned from the last year, it's that companies make it a priority to layer the security of their networks. Now, one of these layers needs to be Things Canary. Unfortunately, companies usually find out too late that they've been already compromised, even after they've already spent millions on IT security. You know, attackers are sneaky. That's right. Unbeknownst to companies, they prowl networks looking for the valuable data. But the great thing about Canary is that they have turned this into an advantage for you. Now, while attackers browse Active Directory for file servers and explore file shares, they'll be looking for documents. They'll try default passwords against the network devices and web services, and they'll scan for open services across the entire network. Now, Things Canaries are designed to look like the things the hackers want to get to. Now, Canaries can be de deployed throughout your entire network, and you can make them look identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, a Windows server, so attackers won't know they've been caught. You can put even fake files on them and name them in ways that get the hacker's attention, and you can enroll them in Active Directory, just like other machines. Now, when attackers investigate further, they give themselves away, and you're instantly notified. Now, Canary tokens act as tiny tripwires that you can drop into hundreds of places, and Canary is designed to be installed and configured in minutes, and you won't have to think about them again. Now, if an alert happens, Canary will notify you any way you want. You won't be inundated with those false alarms. In fact, you can get alerts many different ways. You can get them by email or text message or on your console through Slack, through webhooks, syslog, or their API. Now, data breaches happen typically through your staff, right? And when they do, companies often don't know they've been compromised. That's right. It takes on average 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. That's too long. The Canary solves this problem. Now, Canary was created by people who have trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks. And with that knowledge, they built Canary. Now, you'll find Canary is deployed all over the world and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit. And for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five canaries, your own hosted console upgrades, support, and maintenance. And if you use code twit in the how do you hear about us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your things canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your canaries with their two month money back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit and enter the code TWIT and the How Do You Hear About Us box. And we thank Things Canary for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the news bites. Now, I've worked in the industry long enough to know that organizations in some part of the markets just don't trust the cloud fully. Now, this is especially true for like what financial organizations or institutions, medical organizations. Sure, ID departments you know, are starting to use the cloud in some capacity in other parts of the market. But the question is, do they actually trust on-premise more? Well, according to a recent report on cloud security by Information Week, 52% of IT decision makers whose company uses cloud services agree that their data is actually more secure on on-premises, that's right. Plus only 19% disagree with that sentiment. Now, 55% actually prefer to keep their sensitive data on-premises with only 16% disagreeing with that. And that means that they might be using cloud services but store most of their data still on-premises. Now, perhaps this concern is driven by nearly universal belief that hackers will focus their efforts on cloud services this year. Well, 90%, 90% agree or strongly agree with that, and only 1% disagree. And indeed, they're already seeing cloud, we're actually only already seeing a bunch of cloud vulnerabilities out there in 2022. And last year revealed a growing market and hacked cloud credentials. About half, around 46%, say that their company accelerated its move to the cloud services because of the pandemic. We knew that. We talk about that all the time. Now, nearly two-thirds, 62% of cred, credit cloud service providers 
it actually improves security compared to what the company could achieve on its own. And only 7% disagree with that. I want to bring my co-host in because this is really interesting data. It seems like IT people are a bit conflicted here, right? They they think that on-premise is more secure, but due to having to kind of be pushed to remote workforce due to the pandemic, they have to trust those cloud providers better. Uh, and they find that you know they could have they actually could do better security in cloud services and get there faster than the on-premise can do. So this is an interesting conflict that they're pulling back and forth. Curtis, I want to bring you in first because you know, if they believe the cloud can do a better job here, why do they still believe in on-premise? You know, that, that's a really interesting question. And I think that a lot of it has to do with just the psychology of feeling like the things that are, if you will, in your building or in your office um, are more secure because you can keep an eye on them. Um, it's it's one that, as we say, they know intellectually that the cloud service providers tend to have more resources to throw at security than they have. You know, it's the same way that um, you know I trust that my uh, cash is going to be more secure in a bank vault than it would be in my mattress. Uh, so why do we still want to have things on prem? Well, let's you know blame the uh, the very old caveman sort of part of our brain. Uh, we want to have things that are important to us within our reach. We want to be able to to reach out and touch them, um, even when uh, we believe the argument that says that it would be safer if they were locked safely away somewhere out of sight. I agree with that. I think a lot of people are talking about, hey, I'm worried about the market, so I'm going to take all my money out and put it in the safe in my house or under my bed or somewhere. Um, sounds very similar, right? They're, they're saying, hey, listen, I, I trust the blank banks most of the time, but I really trust this physical medium better, that this, way, this place where I can bring things back on premise, where I can see it, I can touch it, I can keep it safe. I get that. I think the interesting thing here is the data is showing that a lot of organizations are forced are being forced to use the cloud. But then they feel that, oh, things are actually not too bad out here. They're secure, they're compliant, I can use it. Brian, I wanna bring you in. You know, the C-suite here, a lot of organizations and their 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 high level uh, vice presidents or their C-suite or people, they're, they, they're being forced. They're, they're not being forced, but they're, they're, they're needing to actually bring things to the cloud in order to support their organization and scale it out. Is this something you think uh, they should even consider, right? Still leaving data on premise? Yeah. Okay. First apologies. Um, it was the second show in a row where the, my Amazon Echo decided to play music or do something right as I unmuted my mic. So apologies, uh, especially to Anthony, who's going to do the editing. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, I think it's, yeah. I think there's actually an interesting possible correlation. Um, I've worked in a lot of organizations where, shall we say, the budgets for cybersecurity uh, are variable. And uh, I think some of it is, well, the old timers, we kind of feel like on premise, we, we have more control. We can touch it. We can work on it. Uh, worst case, we can yank the plug on it if we need to. Um, but I think one of the surveys that I would love to see is while there's some good numbers coming out of this survey on who trusts the cloud versus who trusts on-prem, I think that needs to be correlated with who thinks cybersecurity is being shortchanged on budget. Um, if you have enough money, I got a sneaky hunch um, if you have enough people to go and look at doing penetration testing, white hat work and things like that, to try and make sure your infrastructure is secure, then there's probably going to be more of a um, trust possibility. But if you feel like, oh, gee, um, we're getting short change, we're, sh we're shorthanded already, um, it's easier the knee jerk is it's easier on premise than it is in the cloud because in the cloud, I've got to go and check 
someone else's work. Because keep in mind, a cloud is just someone else's computer. And, you know, how good a job did they do? If I don't have enough budget to check up on them, maybe I'm not going to trust that. Yeah, I think that's that's the challenge is like, uh, you know, the, the organization needs to set aside uh, time to, to verify their data. You know, obviously, a lot of their data organizations are going to need to keep some some data is going to be need to be kept on prem that's why we still have these hybrid situations um but a lot of cloud services out there are now becoming more compliant they they have government cloud now so they're 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 giving them organizations less and less reasons to have to worry about where their data is is stored at now i actually had uh, talked to an organization a while back and they were worried about the fact that once you move to a cloud service, your latency becomes higher, or or your your data is you know, farther away, and so you're going to get you know slower um, acquisition of that data, um, and and of course then they also bring in the security side of things. Well, it's less secure. What if you know somebody breaches the data? Um, you know, th- so there's a lot of concerns that that need to be mitigated. And a lot of these cloud services are not necessarily doing a great job of ensuring them that they can they can uh, th- that it'll be safe or that they'll have these these direct um, access to the data. Now, Curtis, I want to throw this back to you uh, for one more thing. I think the interesting thing here is that you know a lot of organizations they have to spend a lot more money uh, for on premise. To, to maintain their current systems, maintain storage, maintain security, um, to, to, to now allow remote workforce to access these services um, securely. Um, is this, is this going to be the forcing function for people to just start ignoring the fact that they want to keep their data on-prem and, and kind of force them to the cloud because of it? Well, I think that, you know, things are forcing them to the cloud in most cases, economics, uh, although there are some cases where functionality is doing that. You know, there are simply some things that are available in the cloud that are no longer available in a self-deployed configuration. You know, one of the things, though, you mentioned that it can cost more money to protect on-premises data than in the cloud. I think a lot of organizations understand that, but they feel like they have a handle on how to protect on-premises data. They feel much less confident in the technology and the strategies for protecting data in the cloud, especially if they're in a multi-cloud environment. So I think ultimately it goes back to them being moved bit by bit to the cloud because it's a requirement technologically, economically, but for a long time to come, they're still going to be inherently more comfortable with on-premises data protection, at least until we have a new generation of IT pros who have grown up with the cloud. Right, right. That makes sense. We'll have to see. I think as we continue this uh, this remote workforce, the hybrid situations, you know, more and more organizations are going to you know, need to to move to the cloud, and we're going to have to see, uh, you know, just how fast organizations will need to adjust. So we'll see. Well, folks, that does it for that bite. I do want to jump in the next bite because it's a very interesting one. Obviously, Wi-Fi 6E is one of the new standards out there. A lot of new hardware coming out around it. A lot of promises, but then we're hearing inklings of the new Wi-Fi seven standard cheaper what's going on there well it's it's the wi-fi alliance they they want something new they want to keep driving innovation they want to keep driving the products because truthfully wi-fi vendors need you to buy product they they don't survive on you sitting on the same wi-fi access point or router for 10 years they want you to upgrade it's their product model. Anyway, Wi-Fi 6E isn't really done yet. You know, there's it's it's a standard, but there's not a ton of product out there um, beyond the enterprise. You know, there's there's some cool looking robotic routers uh, from various vendors, um, but 6E is getting there. Well. Wi-Fi 7 is one of those teases. It's off in the distance. Um, There's a lot of promises. 
And the Wi-Fi Alliance is saying, well, we should be able to do all kinds of really cool things. You know, 30 gig per second, according to them. And well, yeah, 6E was supposed to be able to do some amazing numbers also. But there's a whole bunch of gotchas. In fact, uh, our Wi-Fi queen, Ms. Mo, um, had kind of an axe to grind. Yeah, sure, these products could do, you know, X number of gig per second. But, oh, gee, um, if you do that, there's no bandwidth left for anyone else on that access point. And I think we're going to start thinking, seeing the same same thing. The other thing that's happening and uh, started raising its head in Wi-Fi 6E is you can't just feed your access point with a gig anymore. You need something bigger. You need bigger pipes, so either multiple gig pipes or you need to be at least using the new uh, 2.5 gig over copper standards. Well, anyway, moving along, there are some advantages. The big issue is channel width. The whole deal about Wi-Fi 7 and to an extent Wi-Fi 6E is QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, and some new features such as multi-link operation. Now, what's cool is by doing this, we're starting to get into devices where you can build these speeds into smaller things like your cell phone. So, it seems that the Alliance spent a little bit more time on catering to the mobile device. So that, that's got some real interesting things. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of seeing is, gee, this is also going to work out really nicely for the cable vendors or the cabling vendors. Um, because if you were, say, an early adopter of regular old Wi-Fi, you probably had Cat5, Cat5e. Well, the problem is in order to get two and a half gig on extended length runs, you've got some cabling upgrades to do. So my personal opinion is Wi-Fi 7 is driving a lot of marketing behind it, um, but it's also trying to cater to the end user. And the end users say, I want to do wireless. I don't like wired because I don't like punching holes in the apartment and having to lose my deposit. Or I don't want to have to go and punch holes into my new home. So Lou Moresca and I had a great time actually upgrading and changing out some cables in his new place. And I'd like his opinion. You know, is is <laughs> Has wireless really been as good as wired for you? You know, I've I've battled with Wi-Fi, uh, you know, in the house and in the in the office here for for a long time. I think I've tried to get, you know, I spared no expense on a lot of the access points, and even then, you're right. The, the bandwidth, the throughput is not the what you need all the time, and this is on latest and greatest hardware too. Um, uh, and I, I just feel like uh, you know hard lines are more consistent. I can get more bandwidth on them. I can get more machines on them. Um, you know, and I so I still you know praise the work that you, you help me do here because it's it helps me get out of having to worry about you know where I'm at or in the house or if I'm uh, if I'm going to lose that bandwidth or you know is it secure um, or if you know if the kids are deciding to put bad devices on it and that kind of thing and so. You know, I, I'm hoping that Wi-Fi 7 here can help with a lot of these things. But in the same sense, I don't think that wired is going away. Um, so I, I, I definitely think that it's just a secondary medium for people to make sure they have backup at this point. Um, and of course, it's just a convenience with their with their their wireless devices like their phones and so on. But in the same sense, you know, for businesses, you know, you know, I think hard lines are here to stay. Yeah. And I, I want to point out to a lot of people. Wi-Fi is a single pie. The more devices, the more people trying to use that bandwidth, you're going to slice that pie thinner and thinner. Uh, wired means you get an entire pie to yourself. So that's a pretty big difference. Now, the way you send your signals can make it better. But even when you start talking about some fairly new equipment, you know, Kurt Franklin, you know, he and he and I have been talking about, gee, we need to go and find someone nice and light to go crawl in the attic, to go run some cables because 
there's a lot of people surrounding his house that have all kinds of different Wi-Fi and they've all left it on auto. So it'll grab whatever bandwidth it can. And sometimes it's trashing your neighbors because keep in mind, if you're running 2.4 gigahertz, the only channels that do not interfere with each other is one, six and 11. If you're on something other than one, six or 11 at the 2.4 gigahertz range, you are trashing someone else's signal. And 2.4 gigahertz also happens to be what a microwave is at. It's also the same frequency for sodium, high pressure sodium lights. It's also the same frequency as a heck of a lot of cordless phones. So Curtis, um, from the, from the enterprise point of view, Wireless sounds really great, but is enterprise really going looking at dumping uh, wired and go to wireless or is there going to be a balance someplace? Well, I think it depends entirely on what you're talking about. For most office workers, I will say now, wireless is what companies are going to. Why? Because it's cheap. When you bring in new people, when you hotel them, you don't have to worry about exactly where they're going to plug in. You just give them a, a Wi-Fi password, a Wi-Fi account, and they're off and running. Now, the differences come in everything from workgroup servers to uh, AV setups in conference rooms uh, to specific applications. Uh, for data scientists, for engineers, uh, for people doing things like, like trading. Now, obviously, when you get into advanced applications like high-speed and high-frequency trading, everything is wired, everything is optimized for speed. But as you say, for most enterprise users, it's going to be a balance. You know, in the same way that the level of security varies with the data, that's being protected, the performance and the type of networking is going to vary depending on precisely what the user is doing. There's a place for both in the enterprise world. The jury's out. There's going to be a lot of people that want wireless because it's convenient, because it's cheap. But then there's going to be maybe, a I won't call it a backlash, but maybe more of a rubber band where things like broadcasts, listening to videos and training and things like that, there's going to be a need for more consistent um, connectivity. Wired is going to be more reliable no matter what, because you get the pie all to yourself. Wireless is going to be convenient. I certainly don't want to have to run um, wire, wired Ethernet to every single IoT device on Earth. Um, not going to work. I'm going to end up with a giant bowl of spaghetti. So it's going to need to be some sort of balance. And I think a lot of things you're going to need is to take a real hard look at your applications, spend a little bit of money on a inexpensive frequency analyzer, like the ones from MetaGeeks that I use, and find out just how much competition there is for that single RF Pi. But you know what? Lou, I think we need to go talk about a sponsor. What do you think? Well, thank you, Chibert. Next up is our guest. But before we get to our guest, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Linode. Now, if you haven't checked out Linode yet, you definitely should. If you want even IaaS services or even services to be more cost effective from those, you know, from those other providers that are out there, you need to check out Linode. With Linode, you get 100% human Free telephone support available worldwide 24-7, 365. Linode's award-winning support team is highly trained team of service professionals dedicated to finding solutions while providing an unparalleled customer experience. Say no to bad customer service and experience the Linode difference. Now, why should you choose Linode? Well, Linode's independence and mission drive them to do a different standard. 
where the customers is the driving force behind everything they do. They have pay-as-you-go, predictable, and transparent pricing. Now, Linode pioneered the predictable flat pricing model for cloud computing. No more anxiety. You don't have to worry about hidden costs out there. They make it simple to launch and scale in the cloud. With Linode, you'll get flat pricing across every global data center and an intuitive cloud manager, full-featured API, best-in-class documentation, and award-winning support. Now, Linode makes it easy to manage your applications in the cloud. And in fact, Linode has proven secure and reliable enterprise grade infrastructure with 11 data centers worldwide, extensive peering relationships and their next generation network. And yeah, now Linode delivers the modern infrastructure and performance in need to innovate at scale. Now, whatever you want to do, listen, host your website, build your app, store or back up your media, easily launch and enrich your developer applications, whether it's hosted services, websites, AI and machine learning workloads, gaming services, or CI CD environments. Now you can launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. You can choose shared and dedicated compute instances, or you can use your $100 in credit or on S3 compatible object storage and much, much more. Linode was rated the easiest to use by G2 Crowd in 2021. That's why cloud developers choose Linode because they make managing complex cloud infrastructure easy with simple bundled pricing, full featured API, and 100% human support. Now, Linode helped pioneer cloud computing back in 2003, three years, three years before AWS. So they have the longevity you know you can trust. Get the cloud support experience you deserve with Linode. No tears, no handoffs. Get $100 in credit. Visit linode.com slash twiet. That's linode.com slash twiet. And we thank Linode for their support of this week and enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today we have CEO and co-founder of Anaconda, Mr. Peter Wing. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you here because this is a really big topic that we haven't really get got really deep into before. So we're definitely excited to get into that. But before we do, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey through tech and what brought you to uh, Anaconda? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm actually a physicist by training and I've always loved computers. But after I graduated college, um, I decided to go and try my hand at the, you know, actually being a professional software developer. Um, and I spent 10 years doing software development, consulting, um, you know, using both my math skills and my sort of physics science knowledge um, combined with first C++, but then Python and the scientific and numerical tools in Python to do a lot of consulting. And then towards the end of the 2000s, I guess the aughts, towards the end of the aughts, I noticed that um, that large businesses were starting to use Python and scientific and numerical Python to do data analysis and larger simulations. So I started Anaconda uh, in the beginning of 2012 to popularize the use of Python for data analysis. And uh, I started in the CTO role and then I moved over to being the CEO two years ago. Fantastic. Now, I love Pi Data. I know just enough to be truly dangerous, but uh, that brings up my my first topic because you know I wanted to get your opinion here. Now, I'm not a data scientist mm -hmm. by by any means. I'm a programmer, um, and you know the question is to you: Is that the future? Is empowering other disciplines in organizations to really make better use of their data by using systems like this uh, really the future for for data? Well, I think so. I think, you know, um, I, I like to say that data science uh, isn't really about just being a job or a job title, but the, the important thing is data literacy. So uh, you, you call yourself just a programmer, but, you know, what program have you ever written that doesn't touch data in some way? Right. It's just that over the last maybe right. 30 or 40 years, we've really siloed out a certain portion of software development to say, well, you get some data from, let's call it a database, and then you do some stuff to it, and then you update the database, right? Or maybe you presented it in a front end view to somebody. But more and more, I think, in the world to come, the world that's already here, um, the programs we write, the correctness of them, the algorithms we choose, they're gonna be really dependent on the data, the values of the data itself. And so I think every software developer um, is going to need to gain some levels of data literacy because it's simply too, too powerful. Um, and in fact, we're gonna hopefully, maybe in 10 or 20 years time, look back at the 
you know, 1980s to 2010s as a brief uh, weird time in information systems when you could separate algorithms from data, um, from storage and IT and infrastructure, when all these things could sort of be, be managed in siloed ways. I think all future information systems are going to kind of go back to being very fused sort of systems that we have to architect and build in a holistic fashion. Right. Now, I do a lot of interviewing, especially at MIT and, and these organizations over here. And I find that a lot of students out there, they're focusing, whether it's a minor or a lot of their um, experience in college is spent on learning data science. They're trying to learn the trade because they know mm -hmm. that a lot of organizations are start seeking out these individuals. And not only that, they pay very well because they're very well needed. The problem is a lot of organizations, they can't afford that. They, they can't afford some of have a great set of people that really understand that tech trade and they need tools to help empower them. And, and like you said, become more data literate in their own sense, including mm -hmm. the C-suite, including some of the executives that are right. out there. So what are we seeing in trending here? Like I, I know you obviously your organization's focusing on that, but are you seeing a lot of around the market, more tools coming out to more focus on other individuals like that? Um, yeah, you know, it's actually not about tools. Uh, your point is, is absolutely correct, right? A lot of people, you know, you, you have a young person going to college, of course, they're going to ask the question, what's the most lucrative job, right? What jobs pay the most? What's most in demand? And there's absolutely a skills and talent shortage around data science, as we're calling it now. But right. the term data science itself, I think, will evolve um, over the coming years, maybe quite quickly. Um, and people will start realizing it really is a subgenre or it's a portion of a bigger thing, which is, yes, thanks for bringing up the, the site there. It's what I think of as the decision sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, some of the tools and techniques that we use in what we call data science, they're ultimately there to get us asking better questions and then answering those better questions and then making predictions and then, you know, holding ourselves accountable, seeing how good were those predictions. So that entire loop of, uh, of sense making, of prediction, of control, all of that is the kind of data infused digital transformation that every business uh, either is on today or is going to get destroyed by not doing. <laughs> but basically the future world has to be one where everyone up to and including the C-suite has the literacy to understand what a nuanced prediction looks like, right? They can't just be looking at PDFs and then making judgment calls shooting from the hip, right? So the future world is one where you know, every MBA, actually, I think MBA programs now, um, all of them teach data science. It's just part of the the, the bag of skills you must have. Um, so I think that's, that's it's such a broad transformation of information systems. Um, everyone has a role to play. And for those organizations that uh, think they don't have the budget to go and hire some hotshot, you know, San Francisco data scientist, um, you know, you have a lot of smart people in the building already. And the most important thing about those people is they actually know your business. So it's way better to invest in the talent you have, you know, get them signed up, uh, get them to download Python, download Anaconda, learn how to do a couple of things over a weekend or two. And I think you'd be surprised how quickly just making that transition from Excel and PDFs and PowerPoints to a notebook and some interactive visualizations, how far that can take you. So right. I would encourage organizations to, to think, you know, kind of in more agile fashion about investing in their own talent. Yeah, I think that's great. A great, great advice. And I think what, what I wanted to ask you is you, you kind of mentioned Python uh, and I, I mentioned beginning um, some Python libraries that are out there. You know, has open, what has open source done for, you know, for the um, citizen data scientists, I guess that's out there today. You know, how, how like I, I think Chibert in the back channel here said, listen, you know, Python data analysis tools, when they came out, you know, a lot of people couldn't afford some of the really expensive uh, applications out there to allow you to do data analytics and, and really Python's enabled developers and, and other people to essentially do what they need to do with their data or at least get closer to what they need to do with their data. But, you know, what have you seen that, you know, we worked with open source for a long time. What have you seen? How is, how is open source impacted it? Uh, it's been absolutely fundamental to it. Um, all of the popular tools that people use, um, the, the most highly regarded, most well-capitalized companies on the planet, you know, the investment banks and hedge funds, um, three-letter agencies, defense, you know, all these people that have limitless budgets, when you look at what their data analysts and data scientists are using, they're using the exact same open source tools that we teach to children or just to students in, in high school and college. And the reason for that is um, it's actually a deeply beautiful aspect of, of uh, technology. Um, which is that, you know, you're, you're right. And Chibert is right in saying that the initial um, 
ragtag team of people that built the Python scientific tools, they were doing these things because they maybe couldn't afford some of the really expensive proprietary software. But in some cases, there were scientists who wanted to do things beyond what the software could do. And so they found a language that could let them extend it for numerical purposes. That language is Python. They built tools, early stage tools like NumPy and SciPy. And that just got a ball rolling of crowdsourced innovation um, where they connect with you know each other around the around the internet around the world, and you eventually have this crowdsourced innovation ecosystem that builds out more capability faster than any single proprietary firm possibly could. So if you look at the big expensive pieces of software, we could be looking at MATLAB or SAS, you know SAS uh, from the from the SAS Institute. Those things cost a lot of money. They've been making money for decades since the 70s, right? Those two pieces of software. And yet neither of those two firms can do all of the innovation within the four walls of their buildings. And so I think the story of the Python ascendancy to um, you know, being so dominant in data analytics is one of the great stories of the successes of open source, Linux obviously being the other one, right? Um, and so I think in this case, the interesting thing about the Python open source movement and the Python data open source movement, different than Linux, is that Linux, you have a lot of um, computer nerds doing things, you know, sort of doing computer nerd things. But with the Python data science stuff, it's scientists, it's researchers, it's people who are not actually software developers by trade, who they picked up a tool and made something that was fit for purpose for themselves. And they put the source code out there, shared with others. And it was kind of the stone soup kind of crowdsourcing thing, almost like Wikipedia, that allowed this gigantic and enormous, beautiful ecosystem to flourish. Right, right. Lots more interesting stuff to talk about. But before we do, we do have another great sponsor. And then I want to bring my co-host back in as well. Well, that great sponsor that we want to thank is CDW amplified services. Now you work hard at making sure you have the right systems and services in place for your organization. I work with a ton of organizations out there and they work hard to maintain those systems and data centers. It's a never ending journey. It's a challenge and you have to stay in budget and you have to have the right hardware and run it smoothly. Well, reaching your organizational goals feels complex and daunting. Not only are you responsible for implementing the right technology solutions, but you must also drive outcomes and innovate and at scale and with speed. Now it's crucial that you have a partner you can trust who really understands your business and goals, and that's CDW. Now, CDW understands that to stay competitive in a changing landscape, you constantly need to move faster and innovate smarter. Now, CDW Amplified Services will design, orchestrate, and manage technology solutions to help organizations accelerate their goals and drive success. From enhancing customer experiences to bolstering security, CDW will help you quickly execute on digital priorities and amplify your organization's vision for today and the future. The experts at CDW will collaborate with you from start to finish based on your organization's unique challenges. They'll develop roadmaps, handle deployment, and manage your environment to ensure the right technology solutions are driving success. Now, here are just a few things that CDW offers. They have advanced cybersecurity protection and response to mitigate threats to your organization's data and physical entities. They also have a multi-cloud strategy to optimize your data and applications across all your cloud environments, allowing you to access from anywhere and the flexibility to scale. Plus, app modernization and software development to make the most out of the existing applications or to develop custom new ones, increasing agility and streamlining experiences. They also have data optimization that empowers you to transform your data into actionable insights from machine learning and data visualization all the way down to storage management and operations. IT support services give you access to 24-7 custom warranty, maintenance, and support services, protecting your investment and freeing your staff's time to focus on the bigger picture. From cybersecurity to multi-cloud strategy, CDW gets you need a trusted partner to help drive success. Reach your technology goals. Trust the experts at CDW Amplified Services. People who get it. Learn more at cdw.com slash services. That's cdw.com slash services. And we thank CDW Amplified Services for their support of This Week and Enterprise Tech.
Well, folks, we've been talking with co-founder and CEO of Anaconda, Peter Wang, about data and data science and that, that field of data science and just how open source has really helped that move forward. But I do want to bring my co-host back in because they've been chomping at the bit here and talking about some really interesting stuff in the back channel. Cheaper, I want to bring you in first. Well, what, uh, I used to be one of the instructors for Oceanography 318 and 418 at the University of Hawaii. And Python, especially things tools like NumPy, have made a massive, massive difference. Um, a lot of scientists just getting started don't have huge grants, and they wanted to be able to go and get the analytics some of the analysis closer to where they're gathering the data. So we taught them how to build Raspberry Pi based instruments um, that cost a fraction of what the um, commercial packages cost. Now, one of the things, the point is, <clears throat> are you seeing a trend? Are decision makers analyzing the data data closer to where the data is coming off. Like we just had a question uh, out of the chat room is, you know, are you guys playing with the SCADA world, you know, industrial sensors? So uh, there's two parts to that question. Um, on the SCADA stuff, so we ourselves as a corporate entity, um, we really provide the tools. And in most cases, unless we're directly engaging with a customer in some kind of professional services capacity, in most cases, the customers are employing their own staff in-house to then integrate that with um, various various kinds of you know uh, in-house pipelines and workflows. Um, now I can say for a fact that some of our customers absolutely use uh, Python-based software to drive real-time industrial processes. That's a real thing. Um, we ourselves, of course, don't have any additional proprietary software for direct interface to SCADA. But this is the interesting thing about when a revolution really takes off like this, like the Python and the open data science revolution, so many people are building things and doing self-integration. That's the power, right? That's the power of it. Um, we don't have to get involved. They don't have to call up a vendor and be bottlenecked on that kind of process. So Python is absolutely being used in the field, being used in integrated in sensors and IoT kinds of applications. Um, it's, it's absolutely everywhere, so uh, for sure. The second part of your question about decisions being made kind of closer to where the data is coming off, um, I think the way I would sort of frame that is that people have a higher demand for agile decisioning and, and sort of higher fidelity prediction. I think that's becoming more and more of the norm. People don't want to wait two quarters to see what happened. They're like, why can't we just figure out today? Why isn't there an online system? Why can't we look at the data exhaust, right? Those expectations are starting to really come, I think, down from not even the C-suite, actually from, from investors, from board level, right? Where, you know, when we talk to VCs, every single VC has a bunch of portfolio investments in AI and machine learning. They're getting quite sophisticated. They have internal analysts that understand how all this stuff works. So they're demanding of their portfolio companies, you know, why don't you have these kinds of intelligent systems? Why don't you have data science and ML AI being applied to your CRM or to your whatever it might be? So I think it's coming top down, just as there's a demand from the bottom up where people are grabbing things off the shelf to, to build new systems. Thanks, Cheever. Thanks, Peter. I do want to bring uh, Curtis back in too. Curtis? Thanks, Lou. And my first question is is about really your competition. You know, we we tend to be talking about the different analytics tools, but but to a certain extent, I have to believe that your primary competition is Excel. I mean, people going is what you're providing enough of a delta in performance to overcome the 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 learning curve. Do you find that to be true? Um, yes and no. I think in a classic uh, innovator's dilemma, disruptive sort of um, situation, um, it's uh, two things are happening at once, right? There are new use cases that people don't even think about using Excel for, and they use Python for them. That was the that was kind of the initial kind of early growth stage. Now that Python is sort of this hockey stick. Um, people sort of go to Python by default because of course you do it in Python, right? So I think that that flywheel has taken off, but that's for new greenfield kinds of applications. For older sort of things or for existing kind of 
uh, workflows where there are a lot of tools, whether it's BI tools like like Tableau or Looker, uh, or whether it's you know just an Excel based workflow. I think you're right in that case. Um, you, actually, one of the the smartest things I've heard said about Python recently is uh, what you just said right now that the biggest competition is actually Excel. That is where people are actually doing their decisioning and. Um, and I think you're right that for a large mass of those people, there's, you know, a tremendous amount of inertia to stick with what you know. Um, but the thing that's interesting also is that new people coming into the workforce, they bring Python capability with them because they learned it in college or they may have learned it in an internship. And when some, you know, 22 year old upstart starts producing interactive visuals, starts making little dashboards, doing all sorts of regression analyses and doing things you couldn't do with the solve button, it starts making you the senior business analyst look pretty bad, right? So I think there's a natural evolutionary process that will be peeling people off into jumping on the Python bandwagon. That being said, as someone who's a, uh, a promoter of Python, I also recognize our community has to build better and better tools for onboarding those kinds of users for disseminating and sharing and collaborative work around the Python tooling. Right now, it's still quite geeky. And, uh, you know, that's both a compliment and a criticism. <laughs> well, you know, my last question then is one on uh, getting the results out of Python. I mean, I'm old enough. Uh, the first language that I had learned was Fortran, and Fortran is superb for handling data, it is a giant pain when you actually have to either bring data in or especially put data out in a human readable format. So are you finding that the, the human readable part of the process is something that people are being more active in using your tool or is there a lot of integration going on between different data visualization tools and the data processing, the data analysis tools that you provide. Um, so when you say human readable, you mean the code itself or do you mean like the data formats or is there a, the, the data format, the, the result bit? of the, the result of the process, you know, the, ah, the point right, of the right. entire exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the final sort of, uh, end stage artifact, let's say, from people using Python, um, it varies. So when when Python is being used for an exploratory data analysis, right, when you have uh, lots of different data sources, maybe sensor systems, maybe existing databases, what, whatever it might be, Python gets used a lot as a Swiss Army knife because they can talk to any data format, any data system. It pulls it all in into some structure that you can quickly code in Python. And then there are a rich set of visualization tools and libraries in Python. Some might say there's too many choices to choose from, but people then just do the analysis work in there. Um, but then at that point, the final artifact isn't maybe even an artifact, it's a you know, clue in your brain. You know better what it is you wanna do. At that point, what people will sometimes do is they will do a data extract and then put it into the visualization system or reporting system that the business demands. You know, sometimes it really is just a picture that someone needs to paste into a PowerPoint or a PDF. Other times they need to take the data, put it into a traditional BI system, and then, then uh, a lot of customers or users downstream can, can consume it from that. But oftentimes Python gets used um, as a production prediction system. So what you actually have is then you have a, you know, a predictive model you've built and that will get deployed onto a server and something hits it on an HTTP endpoint and they get a prediction out. And so there's no visualization at all there. So Python can do any of these different things. I mean, it really has uh, risen to great uh, power because of the fact that it is such a wonderful glue language. It'll run anywhere, it'll talk to everything and it is very flexible in its outputs. That's awesome. Now, I've got a lot of students still at the University of Hawaii that contact me if and sci and oceanographers and so forth. Where can people go if they want to learn more about Anaconda and, you know, using it for their data? Well, it's uh, it's really simple. It's anaconda.com. So we paid quite a bit of money for that domain. Um, so please go there, anaconda.com. And um, if you go there, you can download our tools. You can download the, the of course, the installer for the Anaconda um, software collection, which has all of the popular libraries you need to get started, including the Jupyter Notebook, 
data visualization tools. Um, if you want to join the community of Anaconda users, you can go to anaconda.cloud. And that is um, a, a user community and system that we call Nucleus. And on that system is where there's discussion forums and we're adding you know, more kinds of uh, blog content and videos. Uh, we're adding training and then web-based runtimes and whatnot later on this year. But that's a, uh, I would encourage everyone to go there. Um, and you know, really at this point, the, we're, we're drowning in an embarrassment of riches when it comes to learning Python, right? There's people with YouTube videos, there's online courseware around these kinds of things. The key thing to learning Python, in my opinion, is picking it up and actually doing a project, finding something you care about, finding something interesting, and just getting your fingers on the keyboard, working a project. Um, and if you do that on a regular basis over a few afternoons or a few weekends, you will find that you've actually gained some competency as a programmer. So that's the place to go. Uh, you can of course follow uh, Anaconda Inc. So at Anaconda Inc. on Twitter. You can follow me personally on Twitter at P Wang. Um, and um, and yeah, that's, I mean, we we have a lot of, you can also look for your local PyData meetup. Uh, you know, I think even in Hawaii, there are some, but all over the world, there are chapters of PyData where you can go and learn from um, other practitioners and other learners of the uh, Python data stack. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter, for being here. Time just flew by. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Thanks so much for being here. I did want to give you a chance to tell the Thank folks you. at home, you told them a lot about Anaconda, but maybe what's coming up for Anaconda? What, what, what should people look out for? So we um, have uh, one of our biggest things that we do to help the open source community is that we um, help businesses secure and manage and accelerate their adoption of these open source tools. So we have um, enterprise and commercial software that helps businesses either on-prem or um, in the cloud or in a hybrid mode uh, manage how their internal users use uh, these these Python libraries and these kinds of tools. And it's a really challenging problem, but we do a good job with it with our enterprise software. So I encourage people to look into that. What we're releasing, what we just announced actually, is long-term support. So that's obviously a really important thing for anyone who's serious about doing these things in, in business. And surprisingly, surprisingly, there really hasn't been an option for that up until this point. So Anaconda is very proud to announce the LTS support for all of these wonderful Python open source libraries um, for enterprise customers. And later in the year, um, we have, um, like I mentioned, you know, more features coming to our Nucleus um, a cloud offering. And we have... Um, uh, well, a lot of other cool tech. I mean, just keep checking back. We have a conference, AnacondaCon, that's in the summer. Uh, it'll be uh, hybrid, virtual, as well as remote. And we encourage people to, to uh, check that out as well. Fantastic. Thanks again for Peter for being here. Well, folks, thank you guys. I want to thank. Thanks again. Well, folks, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. It's definitely a team effort. And I want to we definitely have the best team in the market, starting with my very own co-host starting with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming week and where can people find you and get in touch with you? Well, I am still tinkering with Linux and try to make a appliance for multiple LTE modem load balancing. Um, I have it working. I just need to go and make it cleaner and auto start and try and scale it down to a teeny tiny little four inch touchscreen. But you know, I've been posting about tinkering and different things like that. And I do a lot of it on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. And um, we'd love to hear from you. Now, if you want to drop a less public suggestion, criticisms, uh, show suggestions, topics you'd love to see, you're welcome to throw an email at me. I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. You're also welcome to throw an email at twiet at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. And yes, Web 3811. Wow, this show went really fast. Um, looking forward to going and playing with Anaconda because, yeah, I still do a lot of my stuff in Python, even though I have retired from the University of Hawaii. Thank you, Cheever. Appreciate you being here. Well, folks, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin as well. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you and all your work? Well, people can find my work, of course, at omnia.com and at darkreading.com. I've got a couple of articles coming up uh, on both places. 
on things like MITRE's DEFEND framework. Everybody knows ATT&CK. Welcome to DEFEND. Uh, if you've got questions, if you've got things you'd like to know about, feel free to shoot me a direct message on Twitter. I'm at KG4GWA. Or you can reach me on LinkedIn uh, or on uh, uh, Instagram, where I uh, do generally a little bit more frivolous stuff, but happy to meet you over there as well. Always happy to talk to members of the Twyatt Riot. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're that person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to get your enterprise and IT goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to our show and catch up on your IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and of course, those links of the stories we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version or video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Now, you may have heard we also have Club Twit. That's why it is an amazing members only ad free podcast service with that bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get any where else and it's only seven dollars a month that's right now one of my favorite things about club twit of course is that that amazing members only discord channel i'm on it right now it's amazing channels in there awesome stuff awesome discussions going on really fun interesting topics love the people that are in there and of course they are masters at the gif so definitely go check that out and be part of that as well join club twit be part of the movement go to twit.tv slash club twit now of course club twit also offers group plans as well corporate group pl group plans that's right it's a great way to keep get your team there as well access our ad free tech podcast and the plans start at five members and a discounted rate of six dollars each per month and you can add as many seats as you like and it's really just a really great way for your it department your developers your tech teams your salespeople to stay on top of and stay up to date and access to all of our podcasts and just like that regular membership you get that twit discord channels access as well as the twit plus bonus feed as well so that's twit.tv slash club twit now after you subscribe you, know, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twyet. We talk about a lot of fun tech topics on this show, especially today, and I can guarantee they will find it interesting as well. So definitely share it with them. Now, if you've already subscribed and you're available on Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. That's right. If you're live.twit.tv, it's a live stream. You can come see behind the scenes, how the pizza's made, all the fun stuff that we do during the show. And of course, you can also join the live chat room as well. We have a re really great set of characters in there at irc.twit.tv. Some amazing reoccurring people in there. Loquacious, Chumley, uh, you know, obviously a whole ton of people in there. Adam24, a lot of great characters and a lot of great conversations. So definitely come in and join the conversation, irc.twit.tv. Now definitely hit me up at twitter.com slash Lou MM, either it's a, a DM or or whatever, whatever conversation you want to have. I'd love having conversations with people. Um, hit me up with some show ideas, whether it's tech topics, talking about opinions, whatever. I love having conversations out there. So definitely send me a message out there and 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 we, we can chat. Of course, if you want to know what I do during my work normal work week at Microsoft, you can check that out at developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we show the latest and greatest ways to make your office applications more powerful and productive for you and how you can build your own customizations by just very simple clicks of a button. So definitely check that out and see if you can make it more productive for you. Create those macros out there for yourself. Well, I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. We couldn't do this show without their support. So thank you, Leo and Lisa. Of course, all of, all, we want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. They continue to support us. Of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi just one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. Chibert, thanks for doing all that work you've done over the years of the bookings and the plannings for the show and getting in touch with all the PR people. We really appreciate appreciate all your support. Now, before we sign out, we do have to thank our editor today, Anthony. He's He does he makes us look good after the fact. So thank you for editing out all of our, all of our mistakes. I appreciate that. <laughs> Plus, we also have to thank our TD for today. He's the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. 
and you do the amazing, I, you know, especially during my time off, I was up in Boston. I was listening to your show, all the episodes, learning, trying out my photography, trying out my, uh, my camera and editing things. I really love this show, Hands-On Photography. What's going on for you in Hands-On Photography this week? My man, thank you so much for checking out the show. But this week, I was able to sit down with Mr. Scott Bourne, legendary bird photographer. But we didn't talk about bird photography. We talked about that dadgum smartphone in your pocket that never seems to get enough credit. So check the show out because he's got a lot of good tips in there, especially for shooting video. Twit.tv slash hop. Thank you, and Appreciate it. And until next time. I'm Louis Moresco, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Don't miss All About Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, all about Android on twit.tv.